Here we go. Jake and Josh are here to analyze the game they love for the team they love. This is another Dolphins Podcast. Here's your host, Jake Mendel and Josh House. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of another Dolphins podcast. I am in the middle of such a conundrum. Do I wish you a Merry Christmas or do I be the first to wish you a very happy Victory Tuesday? Merrick, help me out here. Which one do we go with? I thought you were going to hit me with the with the Happy New Year here. You you led me on a little bit, but uh, it, it's all of those things, right? It is a Merry Christmas. It is a, a Happy Victory Tuesday and it is a Happy New Year. Uh, the Miami Dolphins defeated the Dallas Cowboys 22 to 20 on uh, on Sunday, and that was a that was a pretty nice result. I think we all felt pretty good with that one. Got our holiday season kicked off the right way, and uh, now I'm here with you guys, bright and early on a Tuesday morning. We're recording this early, man. It's 7:34 here in in the morning in Iowa where I'm at, but uh, you know I'm waking up to the fresh smiling faces of my dolphin buddies here and happy to to talk dolphins football with you guys how you doing josh i'm doing good man like i told you guys i mean ever since my oldest has started school this entire house has been sick so shocking you might hear some kids call from the back they are sick again um but jake i think you need to wish us a victory tuesday right i mean this is awesome dude that we finally uh beat a good team dolphins are in great situation that was the perfect early christmas present for all of us so i'm doing great despite the sleepy still in my eyes how about you, Jake? How was your Christmas, man? Very good Christmas. Very fun Christmas. Um, I need to be better at not tweeting during games while I'm drinking. I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there. Um, I do. Wait. Everyone should just give everybody a pass, though, right? I mean, like, I think that's what Twitter's always been for, just ranting and going through the motions together so about too. being a fan. But I see people always, you know, bringing up tweets from during the game, and you just got to let that all go, man. Use the uh, men in black thing and zap us with it. I think you should be allowed during game time, during the hours of game time. If anybody is an idiot on Twitter, you have full reign to absolutely go out, the, go at them for being an idiot. I think that's fair. I think that is the real key here is spreading the holiday spirit is being mean to each other on Twitter. But no, it was absolutely fantastic to see how this Miami Dolphins team performed. Um, did you guys watch it with family? Were there any troubles there of being that maniac uh, football fan where you have, you know, uh, that realization when 70% of the population doesn't care about football and you're stuck having your favorite team on and you have to try to be normal was, or was that just me? I, I was sans family for this one. Thankfully, uh, you know, I, I was actually feeling a little bit under the weather myself. I, I was joking before we started recording that I must've caught it from Josh's kids through the, uh, through the cameras we're using here. Cause uh, I was, you know, vomiting all night the night before the game and maybe it was nerves maybe that that could have been it maybe i was just nervous for the for the cowboys game but uh uh I, w- I was a little more reserved than i normally am during this game but there were still definitely a couple times i jumped up out of my chair and started shouting at the at the tv uh very specifically the first time was that christian wilkins roughing the passer call where dak pulled him down on top of him and i'm like what are you blind and maybe some like expletives as well, but uh, no, no. Uh, hey, hey, that's football, right? What a fun one! Did I disappear? Did I, did yes. I do the disappearing thing? Yeah, just, disappearing. just for, I, just for a moment. <laughs> I was gonna say. I mean, I always have to watch with people that don't care because I got three little kids. So they, um, thankfully, the youngest, who's almost two, her nap time is right around four. So I put her down. Was able to watch most of the game and. My wife's an Eagles fan, you know, in limbo, more of a Dolphins fan because of me. But um, all my relatives, in-laws, everyone, you know, sitting there telling me, you have to beat the Cowboys for us. And um, like we're going to talk about, they went out there and did that. So um, besides the kids, man, no, it was just me and a sleeping baby and some cats being able to watch this one. How pleasant. I didn't do any research for this mashup, but I'm going to try it. I never thought I'd start a podcast with this. But is it safe to say that Jason Sanders' money sign grew five times the size on Sunday. Not only did he convert three for three on 50 yard field goals for the first time since 2020, Jason money signed Sanders connected on five field goals. The key for Miami Dolphins victory guys. Here we do. Here here we go. We're starting the new year. We're talking, we're talking kickers. Is this how you make, is this how you do playoff appearances? Is this how teams are supposed to win and, and just kind of find reasons to put other teams away? Is it all about winning via the kicker? Dude, Jake, there was no other way you could start this discussion off uh, other than the fact that Jason Sanders was the man on Sunday. Like you said, five field goals, 
three from from plus 50 yards set a new career long 57 yarder and that was the first one when mcdaniel lined up for that one i was like oh my god what are we doing here we don't kick the one at a fourth and fourth and goal from the five we bypass that one but but we're lining up for this 57 yarder over here and he's gonna miss it and give the cowboys great field position and then boom he nailed it and it was like oh okay all right okay go. jason here we go and then two more from 50 plus he mixed in a, a shorter one later on and then of course the the game winner as as time expired and it was like that's kind of what you needed to see right you know there's people out there that are like oh the dolphins the offense stalled and they had to settle for field goals against a good team and that's going to come back to bite them when they play other teams later on down the line but there's a part of you that actually feels really good about seeing that happen because we had all lost confidence in jason sanders over the last couple seasons his 2020 year was magical all pro, like you said, Jake. But the last couple of years, he's been real shaky, especially from those longer distances. But on Sunday, he made three from 50 plus, five for five on field goals, added the extra point uh, as well, six for six on kicks. And you, you needed to see that if you wanted to feel confident in the player moving forward. And like you mentioned, Jake, this is this is kind of what playoff football is all about. You got to have a, a solid kicker, a good defense. You got to be able to run the ball well. And the Dolphins went out there against the Dallas Cowboys and they put in a, a, a tough, a gritty performance. It, people forget it was raining. It was very soggy and wet down there in South Florida on and off throughout the game. We've seen this team struggle in inclement weather in the past. And when the weather is like that, like it's going to be uh, for some of these playoff games moving forward, you got to be able to play that, that kind of tough, gritty football. And, and that comes down to making those kicks, making those long kicks. And that's exactly what Sanders did. So I actually kind of felt felt good about seeing all those field goal attempts and especially the fact that he made all of them because it does give you confidence in, in Jason Sanders moving forward. And it makes you feel like, hey, maybe we're getting that 2020 version of Jason Sanders. And and what's what's the what's what's the deal with Sanders, right? He's always good in even years, right? Well, the playoffs start in 2024. Last I checked, that's an even year. And we got Money Sanders back for that, baby. Let's roll. That's analysis. That's why you tune into another Dolphins podcast insight like that. You won't you won't hear that anywhere else. I promise you. No, you won't. I'm surprised you never heard the saying, Jake, that kickers win championships, because that must have been before your time or something like that. But um, us on the pod, we can be honest, right? And it goes back to you talking about tweeting during the game. I mean, when you're tweeting during a game and Sanders misses a field goal, the first thing you're going to do is sit there and, you know, crap all over him, say all these bad things. We were the first ones to add that money sign. So let us just be the first to say that. We were also the first to take that money sign away. So um, we are going to permanently give that money uh, sign to Sanders. Um, he hit three from 50 plus yards, like you both said, becoming the first Dolphins player in history to do that in the same game. 57 52 54 35 and 29 like you guys both mentioned and it was his first um game tying or game winning field goal since 2022 when he hit a 50 yarder with 18 seconds left against new york jets i do think like you both mentioned seeing this happen you know some people were upset that the drive stalled i've more so feeling like merrick did i mean i wanted to see this from jason sanders there are times when you can take those points and feel good about getting three points especially once you know the playoffs begin so um to see jason sanders go out there like merrick said and in, in bad weather at times, making those field goals, draining them when we needed it. Um, it was awesome. And I just hope they can continue to do that moving forward because to have a kicker that's absolute money, you know, when you need it, um, it can go a long way again during playoff time. It definitely felt like I was playing NBA Street a little bit where he's from downtown, he's heating up. And <laughs> you guys both nailed it. I think when you reach the playoffs, you want to see so many different players prove they can win you a game. Again, I go back to that David Long quote about you don't know who's going to be that guy to step up and make the plays when you need him the most. And when you're playing in these playoff type atmospheres and you have different guys proving, hey, I, I can step up, I can have that performance. It means the entire world. Uh, what were your guys' thought? Uh, that first quarter there, before that first field goal where, you know, Merrick said it, that 57-yarder was a career best for him. Uh, McDaniel calls that timeout right before. Um, I think the broadcast showed that I think Durham Smythe wasn't on the field and they were missing a player. Uh, but there was kind of some going back and forth. Are they just kind of trying to test it out? Are they actually going to kick it? What were your guys' thoughts during that moment? Did, were you confident that they were going to walk Sanders back out following that uh, commercial break? No, absolutely not. I was like, all right. Because as soon as he lined up for the 57-yarder, I was like, what are we doing? Why does – like, it always feels like Mike McDaniel does the exact opposite of what everyone else would do in situations like that, whether he's going for it 
on a fourth and five, or he's kicking a long field goal or, or whatever it may be, or he, he's passing on third and one or, you know, whatever, whatever the situation is, you're always like, why is he doing this? And, you know, I kind of get the logic behind it. He's trying to buck trends and catch people off guard or whatever, but you're not really catching people off guard when you're lining up for a 57 yard field goal. You either kick it or you don't. So I definitely thought they were going to try and, you know, maybe do some weird special teams motion. I don't even know if that's legal. Um, you know, try and draw him off sides, get the first down and, and continue the drive. But when they snapped the ball and, and, and Sanders lined up for the kick and, and, and booted it, I was like, what is happening here? And he nailed it. And like, it was kind of veering off to the left a little bit, but other than that, that thing looked like it was good from 70. He, he launched that thing. So credit to Mike McDaniel credit to, you know, special teams coaches. You have to think that Pre-game warm-ups come into play a little bit. They see how he's feeling that day. Hey, how, is he accurate? Has he got the strong leg? What are the, the conditions, the wind, whatever, whatever, right? And and they must have seen something during pre-game warm-ups that said, hey, Sanders is on today. Let's give him a, a, a chance to, to really go out there and, and boot some of these long ones. And that's exactly what he did. So not to answer your question, Jake, I definitely thought that was going to be some sort of attempt to draw the Cowboys off sides there. Merrick, you know when you get a drink – and you forget that you have a straw and you're just kind of sipping out of the top and you kind of got to navigate a bunch of ice. But the, the farther through the drink, you get more in ice just slapping you in the face because you just can't hold it back when you're drinking the water. You know, you know what I'm getting at here? Jake, I love your analogies. So How, what, what, did you plan this ahead of time? Did this just pop into your head or, or did you? Say it's coffee, baby. So <laughs> I have a bunch of stats here that I've been holding back about Jason Sanders for a couple weeks here. And I'm about to be all that ice just slapping you in the face here because we feel that confidence going away with Jason Sanders. But like, he's been an absolute stud this year. When you really think about it, he did not kick a field goal, did not have a field goal attempt against the chiefs. Since then, there have been at least three attempts in four of six games. He has one miss from more than 50 yards at that time. He has two misses in total. He's been 15 of 17. On top of that, he's five of seven from 50 yards this season. So, like, I remember doing Dolphins detail with you earlier before the season started, just saying, like, Jason Sanders, you know, the even years. Like, there is there is a great kicker somewhere deep down inside there. You're a former first-team All-Pro. We know it can come back out. I don't think players just, you know, snap the fingers and they break. And, and for years we've had McDaniel, Danny Crossman, the special teams coordinator, hyping up Sanders as that guy who was that former first team all pro. And I think this year, you know, there haven't been a lot of massive performances because of the Dolphins offense, and, and this will be something to talk about shortly, but they've been doing a good job just scoring the touchdowns and making it work. But now they're showing that, hey, that, that guy's still there as well. Yeah, and you just you really love to see it. Like we talked about, just just being able to see a game like this from Sanders as we wind the regular season down, we gear up for the playoffs, hopefully a deep playoff run. Like you just wanted to see you wanted to see a game from him so you could feel confident. And I'm sure he feels the exact same way. Like you said, didn't get a lot of opportunities earlier on in the year as the season has wore on and, and this Dolphins team has been tested with injuries. This offense has slowed down a little bit. I'm still getting them into field goal range, which is great. Uh, but now Sanders had an opportunity to go out there and show that he can still be that guy that he was in 2020. So it's just it's, it was a confidence booster for us, for his coaches, but for the player himself. And you love to see it. After he kicked that game winner, he gave us the Kobe Bryant one, two, three, four, five. Uh, that was awesome. That was really cool because now you know. There's your definitive proof that he's feeling himself a little bit. And, and when you get that confidence, it can be a real boost to your game. So hopefully he can keep that confidence moving forward. And hopefully that means good things for the Miami Dolphins. Josh, I got to ask you, though. Looking at this performance from this Miami Dolphins offense, they were one for four in the red zone. This was a win. Great performance. The Dolphins have a shot at the number one seed. Should we be concerned about this offense's inability over the past couple weeks to really consistently punch it into the end zone? Was that to me? I keep cutting now. I got kids running around. I got all sorts of things. The only thing I was going to say, going back to the Sanders thing, was wonder if it's because it was a career high they were going to let him go out there and try to hit that thing, right? I mean, 57-yarder, maybe that's why they went out there. But to your point, Jake, I absolutely am a little bit worried about it. I think, to me, the biggest thing is maybe the play calling down there. For another week, after he was on hard knock saying that it was a trash call, he went down there and tried to fade again in the red zone. Um, I think I saw Chase Claypool line up at one point on the right side at the goal line, and I got a little bit excited, thinking maybe that was the time we were going to see him with 
that fade. But yes, their inability to punch that ball in, um, you know, and the play calling down at the goal line is definitely something to be skeptical of and, you know, to kind of watch as the weeks progress. But um, again, when you got a field goal kicker that's playing the way he is, when you got the big play ability like the Dolphins, I'm not too concerned about it, but you need to win game when you need to win games in the playoffs and things like that, you're going to need to score and convert in the red zone. And lately, it's just not been the case for the Dolphins. Yeah, I agree, Josh. I think it's a it's a it's a philosophy issue. You have an offense that's built around speed, not necessarily built around size, right? So if your top two receivers are Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, not big guys, and your running backs are Raheem Mostert and Devon A. Chan, not big guys. Now you you saw what Jeff Wilson could do later in the game. You saw him kind of ice that game there and and get him down into field goal range to kick the game winning kick. So you wonder if maybe he can start mixing in a little bit there. But you got an offense that's so so much built around these these smaller guys that when they get into the red zone they they stall a little bit because you kind of need some bigger body dudes to get in there and kind of play that low post in basketball where you're boxing people out and you, you can you can get a ball that that's thrown directly within the numbers or you can high point a catch and go up there and get a 50 50 ball and they haven't really been using those guys yet and they're like oh well you know fade to cedric wilson he's one of our bigger guys He's still not really a big body dude. I'm pretty sure Cedric Wilson's like six foot even or six foot one, like not necessarily a, a, a what you would consider a bigger body guy. This team is missing. And I hate to say it, this team is missing a little bit of Mike Kosicki. Don't you think uh, a, a taller dude that can go up there? He's got the hands. He can get the, the 50, 50 balls. Um, you know, Durham Smythe, more of a, more of a, you know, short yardage type guy, more of a blocker. He, he had himself a, a great game against the Dallas Cowboys, um, but he's not really that red zone threat that you're looking for there. So you do have a guy, like you mentioned, Josh, like Chase Claypool out there. And maybe this Jalen Waddle injury, which we haven't talked about yet and we'll probably get to, he's got a, a high ankle sprain, it sounds like, could, could miss this weekend's game, maybe a little bit longer than that. Hopefully not, fingers crossed there. Maybe this forces Chase Claypool into the lineup. Maybe this forces Mike McDaniel to get Chase Claypool a little bit more involved. And I'd like to see him a little bit more involved in these goal-to-go uh, situations because he is that bigger body guy. He is a playmaker with the ball in his hands. Maybe we can see him do a little something when the Dolphins get down in those in those uh, you know go to goal those red zone situations because there is an issue here. There is an issue. It surfaced last week. It surfaced again. Uh, you know the this week against the Dallas Cowboys, and you're sure it's going to surface again as as we continue on through the season. And Mike McDaniel needs to figure out how to maneuver. Uh, these these areas of the field into into touchdowns because it hasn't happened as of late and we need to get back to to scoring some points if we want to keep our eye on the bigger prize of a Lombardi trophy later on so everyone instantly goes to like hard knocks last week right one of the things McDaniel did is he pointed out that um, jump ball to Tyree Kill and said this is a trash play call I don't necessarily put this play to Cedric Wilson in that same bucket because you look at what's happening Tyree Kill's lined up in the slot and he's triple covered I think what we've seen in the past is just give Cedric Wilson a chance to make a play. And the way the Dallas defense was set up was to say, hey, simply let Cedric Wilson be the guy to beat you on the outside. I think that, like, I don't want to get too discouraged about Mike McDaniel coming out and saying a play call is trash. And then, well, he went right back to it. I do think the play call was entirely different. And I do think the Cowboys have a great red zone defense where they were able to pressure Tua consistently and make him find those different reads. When we saw Tua miss a couple out routes and different things like that, I think it wasn't that Tua missed the throw. It's that the Cowboys did a good job of getting the timing and the rhythm off. Like the ball was where it was supposed to be. The wide receiver, just the, the rhythm wasn't there. The opportunity wasn't there. And I'll give the Cowboys credit for that more often than not. Um, I wanted to bring you guys in and, and kind of lead up asking if this team has red zone issues. And, you know, you kind of feel that way, except like you, you think about the fact here, guys, that the Sanders started the year with back to back three field goal attempts per game. Um, and then he didn't attempt more than one until the Raiders game. He has three attempts or more in four of the last six games, but also in the, four of the last six games, he's attempted at least three extra points. That means in four of the last six games, this team has also scored at least three touchdowns. So do you think there's a little bit here that they're swinging it the other way? This offense maybe has some growing pains, but it's not necessarily that big sign of a concern about these red zone struggles just yet that maybe this is a 
a little bit of an opportunity for Mike McDaniel to gear some things up for the playoffs as defenses are finding out these ways right now to kind of slow them down instead of it being week 17, week 18, maybe that first round of the playoffs. Crazy. We're sitting here talking about this, but you know, chestnut checkers. I don't know. No. And I mean, that's certainly the hope, right? And Mike McDaniel, you know, reputation as an offensive guru an offensive genius and, you know, probably rightly so he's done wonders for this Miami Dolphins offense and to a tongue of Aloha especially, but you, you hope that he can see some of the issues that the team has been facing as of late and, and scheme around that and make some corrections and, and add on to it and throw in some new wrinkles and keep defensive coordinators guessing. That's what's so cool about this Miami Dolphins team. And not just from Mike McDaniel, but from Vic Fangio and, and the other coaches and players as well, is that they seem to be able to adjust game plans mid game to figure out, okay, this isn't working. What can we do differently to, to get this ship righted? You know, you saw that against Kansas city, right? They were shut out in the first half. They came out the second half. They didn't win the game. They ultimately lost the game, but they came out the second half. The offense was completely different and played a lot better. Right. Mm -hmm. And you've seen that multiple times throughout the season. So you really hope that Mike McDaniel is going to be able to go back to the drawing board at 4 a.m. like he often does. I'm sitting here complaining, not complaining, but, you know, talking about how we're recording at 7.30 in the morning my time, and Mike McDaniel's already been in the office for three and a half hours listening to multiple Eminem CDs uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get these game plans going down. Uh, but I do feel confident. I, I do have trust and faith in Mike McDaniel that he'll be able to get some of this stuff figured out. Um, and And that is a good feeling. That is a good feeling because in years past, that has not been the case with this Miami Dolphins team. You, you've you watched them struggle, and then the next week, same issues. And the week after that, same issues. And the week after that, same issues, and we're eliminated from playoff contention, and we're all going, well, maybe next year's the year. And, hey, any good coach is available, but uh, we got our good coach. Mike McDaniel's that dude. I have faith that he'll be able to, to get this stuff uh, situated and, and figured out. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, I was trying to find the actual percentage, but this team was very good in the red zone previously, right? Wasn't it last year? They were Every time they get down there, they'd almost, you know, find pay dirt. So, um, again, I think it's just the way that teams are preparing for the Dolphins, and I do think, you know, maybe Mike McDaniel's saving some things in his bag of tricks for, you know, when he has to unleash them for those playoff push. And like Jake mentioned, I'm sitting here talking about the fade. A lot of people were complaining about that fade, but that's a route, right? They're not going to just completely take the fade out of um, their, their route tree and, you know, never throw another fade again. So um, touche there, Jake, touche. So I don't think it's an issue. And you did mention Jeff Wilson getting more involved. Was Devon Achan banged up there in that? Or was it just the, the feel of the game and the flow of the game? Because I was trying to look and see if Achan got banged up or anything like that. But Jeff Wilson really, you know, showed the type of thunder that he can be, right? And, you know, you might need that down at the goal line. So I'm definitely intrigued to see how his usage is. And I think we talked about on the podcast, he might be that break in case of emergency running back that we needed towards this playoff push. So I'm definitely intrigued by his usage as well. For, for the, I got one more metaphor here and I think it will go, go good for this running back group. Think about they're all working at a valet, right? And Devon H. Chan, like his dad grew up with a stick. He can, you know, park any car, but let's just say cold plays in town, that parking lot. He ain't used to seeing the parking lot that packed. Sometimes you need that old grizzled vet who's been, operating under every single hood of every single car for the last 40 years. That's Jeff Wilson. Sometimes you need Papa Jeff just to come in, settle everything down, take care of business. And he had a third down reception and an out route that I thought was impressive as all hell. He had the final third down conversion to win the game. I mean, we've been waiting for the Jeff Wilson experience and you can, I've been wondering what's different from this year compared to two years ago in San Francisco when he wanted a trade because he wasn't getting happy, any opportunities. Well, you can see what he means to this team and to this locker room and group of guys, especially when they're willing to lean on him. Five carries, 21 yards, most of that coming in the fourth quarter. I really love that you went cold play there. You had you had every musical act in history at your disposal, and your first thought was cold play. That's that's the big one. That's the, <laughs> that's the one that's selling out the arena. Watch out, man. Cold play, it sells. <laughs> so I, I was thinking about this as the game was going on as a selfish Devon A. Chan fantasy owner. By the way, speaking of fantasy, I was playing against Jason Sanders in my oh god <laughs> in my semifinal. 28 points. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's just say that uh I don't have to worry about fantasy anymore this year because I lost. So um, but I was thinking about this as 
as the game was winding down. And, and I, I believe Achan had a near fumble at one point where he was down and then they had ripped the ball out just a split second afterwards. And he is a rookie. He's been an electric rookie. He's been very impressive this year. But sometimes with the game on the line, you just want to feel like like Jake said, you want to go with the mechanic who's been under every hood hood in the in the garage. You want to go with the guy who's been there, and you want to go with the guy who knows that hey, ball security is is a big thing right now. Let's let's keep this ball in our possession. You know, we can't turn it over or else we won't win. And also another another factor I would say is that once you get a defense tired. Once you have them running around all game trying to defend that speed and, and they, they no longer have the energy to, to play at 100%, that's when you bring in the hammer. That's when you bring in a Jeff Wilson and you run it straight up the middle, right up the gut, and you punch him in the mouth. And that's exactly what the Dolphins did. That's exactly the game plan that Mike McDaniel called. And it worked to perfection. We saw Jeff Wilson convert on, on a, a couple key third and shorts in a row there to ice the game. It was the difference between allowing that clock to run down to two seconds and let Sanders go out there and kick the game winning kick as time expired or kicking the go ahead field goal and giving the ball back to the Dallas Cowboys offense only down two points with a minute to go and multiple timeouts. That's scary. That's a scary situation. The Dolphins defense have been playing well, but to tell you the truth, I wouldn't have liked our, our odds in that scenario. So Jeff Wilson coming in, being that hammer when that defense is tired. I thought that was a great idea by Mike McDaniel, and I think that might have had something to do with it. Yeah, I just have uh, pulled it up on the Dolphins page. Uh, he converted a third and two for a six-yard gain on the ground, and then he had to 14 total yards on three carries on that final drive. So we're sitting here praising him, and it's crazy that those 14 yards and how you know big of a difference it was. So, it really again, hat tip, to, hat tip to Jeff Wilson and, you know, like you said, Mike McDaniel for bringing him out there and using that thunder when the whole stadium, when everyone knew they were going to try to, you know, get down there, run the clock, they did it. And tat tip to Jeff Wilson for sure. Yeah. That entire last drive is so impressive. And I hate to make this comparison just because it instantly goes to the Super Bowl rings. But I mean, that final drive by the Dolphins, it felt like the Peyton Manning Colts. It felt like the Tom Brady Patriots. It was Thanos. It was inevitable that you're going to drive down the field. We're going to squeeze out all the clock. We're going to kick the field goal and there's nothing you can do about it. At the end of the day, as you start to follow along with these teams that are winning 12, 13 games a year, it's not going to be 70 to 20 every time. I think it's impressive when you can have those answers. And at the end of the day, you know, show another team, hey, we're going to go. We're going to win this game. You're going to there's nothing you can do about it. And I think that's super impressive in itself. Before we wrap up here, it will be probably the naughtiest thing we could do this year to not talk about this Miami Dolphins defense. Not that type of naughty, Merrick. You put those eyebrows away. You, but I do want to You don't ask know how you, naughty I can get, Jake. <laughs> We have Are we there, have an idea. We have, <laughs> it gets crazy there, in the DMs around here between us three. <laughs> Are there three defenses in the NFL that are better than the Miami Dolphins? Ooh, well, okay, so just and no. you know, you, you, I I'll play devil's advocate. You know, it's it's worth the discussion, is it not? That's why you brought it up, Jake. Is kind of what we do on a podcast. We we discuss, but if if you were to try and name three right now. I think you'd start with the San Francisco 49ers, you know, they Monday night football or whatever they're calling it holiday Christmas shebang. I think that's it. I saw the yeah, graphic. But... It said shebang. Um, uh, the 49ers defense, real solid. A um, lot of good players on that one. You look to them like they could possibly be better than the Dolphins. Um, but again, the fact that this is all debatable is really cool, especially how the year started and everyone was questioning Vic Fangio. Uh, then you look at the Eagles defense. The Eagles defense is is pretty stout, but they've been giving up points as of late. And they gave up a decent number of points to uh, Tommy DeVito and Tyrod Taylor yesterday uh, against the Giants. So you look there and they've been struggling a little bit. That, that Cowboys defense is is a nice, solid one. Um, we just beat them, put 22 on the board. Not a, not a crazy number, but enough to get the victory. I don't know. You might be right, Josh. You might be right. There might not be three better defenses. The Ravens defense obviously has to be has to be in the conversation as well, but there might not be, be three better defenses than the Miami Dolphins right now. Do you put anyone on that list, Jake? Baltimore was the Baltimore would be the best defense and then maybe the Browns Kansas are up City. there too. Forgot the oh, Browns. Yes, Browns can still get the number 1 seed. That, that's pretty crazy. So well, the Ravens, though, that's definitely the one I was 
battling between whether they're better than the Dolphins. And I guess we'll see this weekend, right? You got a big Not match. Not to like oversimplify things, but you look at that Baltimore defense, they're averaging 3.6 sacks per game. The Miami Dolphins are second in the NFL with 3.5 sacks per game. They had four against the Dallas Cowboys. Headlined Andrew Van Genkel, one and a half sacks. Bradley Chubb, one and a half sacks. The awesome thing about Bradley Chubb is because not only did he reach double digit sacks, the first person to do that since Cameron Wake, which it's always awesome that we get to hear your Cameron Wake's name, but he's like the perfect combination of Olivier Vernon and Wake because not only is he getting the sacks, but man, I can go back and watch five, six plays from Sunday's game where he was inches away, centimeters away from having another sack. There was one we almost batted the ball out. From Dak Prescott right before he threw it away, you could really sell, uh, tell how great Dak is inside the pocket. But, man, this is a group without a former first-round pick and Jalen Phillips on that line. They are looking absolutely awesome, and that's what has me thinking. I mean, this is a group that, you know, top three defense, I don't want, I don't care about debating about number one. This group is special, and if they're two, if they're three, I don't think that matters. They're more than good enough. And that's what we wanted to see. When Vic Fangio was hired, that's what the expectation was. And we all started getting confident and and just really excited for this season to start based on that idea. If you could pair what this offense was last year, plus the next evolution of this offense that you were going to see naturally over a new offseason, everyone's back together. They're not working on mastering the offense. They're working on... Uh, you know, building it into something even bigger and better. So if you can, if you can pair that offense with a Vic Fangio led defense, who, you know, if you look at his track record, he always takes these defenses into top 10 defenses in the league. He just, it's quick turnaround with, with Vic Fangio. So if you compare what that offense was with what a Vic Fangio defense could be, we all thought to ourselves that man, that's the makings of a really damn good football team. And it didn't start off that way this year. It takes time, right? Learning a new system. Jalen Ramsey was injured, you know, dealing with all of that stuff, trying to trying to trying to get this defense firing on all cylinders. Rounded into form, middle of the season. Coincidentally, when Jalen Ramsey came back, just saying, what a stud. And now all of a sudden you're seeing a complete football team. That's exactly what that win was against the Cowboys. That was a team victory in every sense of the word. Offense defense and special teams all three units played so well but but to see that coming to fruition after an off season of us getting our hopes up and we're dolphins fans so we know every time we get our hopes up there's that inevitable letdown that's going to happen but it hasn't really happened yet keeping our fingers crossed that it doesn't but uh i don't know this is a special team it's a really special team and and like you said jake it's got us with with visions of even bigger things dancing in our heads post christmas here yeah, and they're doing this without Jalen Phillips. Javon Holland's still out of the lineup, right? And this defense has just been unbelievable. I mean, coming into the year, I think we all sat here and we're talking about how awesome the secondary was, but it has really been the defensive line. It's just absolutely gone ballistic this year. Jake mentioned Chubb. I didn't even realize this, but they broke the team record with 52 total sacks this season, um, 121 quarterback hits already. Sealer has his career high, eight and a half sacks. And I had this stat from the Dolphins, and I thought it was pretty cool. Van Ginkle now has two sacks in his past two games. Um, six on the season, which is a new career high. Van Ginkle joins Aiden Hutchinson and TJ Watt as the only NFL players this season with four plus sacks, five plus pass defense, one plus interceptions, seven plus tackles for loss, and 10 plus quarterback hits. So um, quite the the group of people to be there. And as we know, Andrew Van Ginkle had what, 10 tackles, one and a half sacks, four quarterback hits, a tackle for loss, and a pass defended against um, the Dallas Cowboys. So Everything about that defensive line has us thinking, dancing thoughts in our head. And I just um excited to see where they can take this to the next level, right? Because when you get a Javon Holland back, when you start to get some of those pieces in the secondary back, that's going to, you know, force quarterbacks to hold on to that ball a little bit more. And um, we already see what Bradley Chubb and those guys are doing, you know, without that stuff. So um, impressive what this defensive line has become. Hope that we can keep them together, as we all know, Christian Wilkins. Um, I, what was your guys' thoughts on that uh, rough in the past? That was absolutely ridiculous. I know Merrick said Weak. he's getting ready to – break stuff but yeah it was bad yeah yeah it was bad but it, 
We got to fight. We talk about this every show, but we got to find a way to keep Van Ginkle on this team, man. Especially with Jalen Phillips coming back from the Achilles. It's going to take a while to, to rehab that. He might not be ready for the start of the season next year. You got to find a way to keep Van Ginkle in the fold. He's just so important to this team. He's just such a high motor guy and, and just such a performer. Just goes out there and, and and every single week you notice Andrew Van Ginkle. Every single week he is making multiple plays that impact the outcome of the game. And, and that's that's a guy that you want on this team. And clearly he wants to be in South Florida. Clearly his wife loves it in South South Florida. So does he. Clearly he loves playing for Vic Fangio and Vic Fangio loves him. Let's figure out a way to get this done. Let's keep him, keep him in Miami long-term. Yeah, I still don't think he's going to cost as much as some others do. The stats are going to look fantastic. It's going to look very well-rounded. And I don't want to discredit him. He's absolutely awesome. But I kind of look at what Kyle Van Noy did in New England that gained him his first big contract even when he came into Miami. There are some players that just work so well in some schemes where you'd really wonder if um, Van, uh, Van Ginkle can go, you know, destination X, Y, and Z, and every defensive coordinator will know how to make sure he can get – you know, the, the six sacks, the six pass event, make sure they're using him every way possible. What were your guys' thoughts early on in this game? It looked like it was going to be the CD Lamb show. Um, first two drives, he had a carry that was like 12 yards. He was lining up in the slot. We already saw it going on on X about uh, why is Cater Kohu lined up on CD Lamb? Why is Nick Needham lined up on CD Lamb? And, and guys, on the surface, it makes so much sense. As you see the Cowboys walk down the field, why don't you move Jalen Ramsey inside? Uh, but to start this conversation, I do want to say I think it's a lot more complex than we make it out to be. I think Dak spends the first quarter, the second quarter, really identifying how we can attack this defense. And if you do line up Jalen Ramsey against C.D. Lamb, it might negate that drive. But the Cowboys will then counter in a different way. And while the Dolphins silence them in the second and third quarter, all of a sudden the Cowboys might be trying different things that are suddenly working. So I do want to say that there is a chess match happening, that it is getting a little tiresome hearing that, Oh, hey, we got to have Ramsey shadowing people. Or is it me being the old guy complaining? No, and you're certainly not the old guy on this podcast, Jake. But uh, but you're right. It is far more complex than just say, oh, well, take Jalen Ramsey and have him follow around and, and that'll be fine, right? The Cowboys offense is not the Jets offense, right? It works against the Jets because the Jets have Garrett Wilson and then, you know, nothing else, right? They have Brees Hall, but we're talking about pass catchers here. And there's really nothing else there. It's, it's very easy to just take Jalen Ramsey and put him on Garrett Wilson and say, yeah, guard him and, and that'll be it. And we saw it, it worked. The Dolphins defense got a shutout. But against the Cowboys, you just can't do that because they have other good players as well. You know, Brandon Cook's great receiver. We saw Brandon Cooks, catch that go-ahead touchdown awesome on Jalen Ramsey. It sucked, but it was awesome. Yeah, and, and that wasn't – that's not a knock on Jalen Ramsey. That was a great throw and a great catch, a heroic performance by Dak and, and Cooks there. Um, thankfully, we were able to overcome it. But it's really not that simple. And when you move Jalen Ramsey around like that, now you're asking everybody else to play a little bit differently, possibly play out of position, and people forget – Javon Holland, your starting safety, he's kind of your, your your guy that gets everybody lined up and, and you, you put him in, in the right position. He wasn't there. Another guy who typically does that, Jerome Baker. He wasn't out there, you know? So you're relying on two backups, capable backups. Brandon Jones played well. Duke Riley played really well. You know, you got those guys in those spots, but you're asking them to coordinate a defense, get everybody lined up in the right spot. And that becomes even harder when you've got Jalen Ramsey playing a little bit out of position and moving around all over the formation. So I understand why Vic Fangio didn't do it. Now, if CeeDee Lamb's domination would have continued into the second, third, fourth quarter, I'd have been pulling my hair, hair out and screaming at the TV and yelling, best put Ramsey on him as well. But we saw, just like we talked about with Mike McDaniel being able to, to alter his game plan, we saw that with Vic Fangio. He was able to get things corrected, and C.D. Lamb was essentially non-existent after the first quarter. I think we had a, just maybe one or two more catches for the rest of the game. Yeah, I mean, I'm never going to say I know more than Vic Fangio. I think the reason it got so much steam was because I think it was Jalen Ramsey's comments, right? He kind of seemed a little bit annoyed that he wasn't going to get this opportunity. Almost bored, I think, was the word that was getting thrown around because he's just hanging out on one side and not going to do much. But the entire scheme would have went to shit, right? Cater doesn't play the same on the outside as he does in the slot. And like you mentioned, the Deshaun Elliott, Cater Kohu, um, the Nick Needham thing, he can just stay on the sideline. I'm sorry. I love you, Nick Needham, but you can just stay on the sideline. Cater Kohu, Deshaun Elliott, I thought they had a pretty nice game plan for the way they um, combated CD Lamb. And like you said, when you have that pass rush that can get to Dak it forces him to make mistakes and as long as you can just clamp down on your guy I mean they had a pretty good um they had a pretty good 
plan for C.D. Lamb, and aside from that first drive, it uh, worked to fruition. The first drive, though, we haven't even talked about the most important play by this defense, and that was the Sean Elliott at the one-yard line making the play of the year. Now, guys, I want to ask you this, and you need to be honest, because despite Christmas being over, Santa is watching and getting ready for next year. Were you kind of just like, whatever, why bother tackling Tony Pollard at the <laughs> one-yard line? They have a first down from the one-yard line. Who cares? Because, I mean, you have Zach Sealer kind of punched at the ground like, yeah, we stopped him. We got to start our hold here. And then you have other people like, whatever, let him walk in. So, so what side were you? On. Did you think the Dolphins had any shot before? What was his name? Uh, Lemke, I think. Hunter, the back Hunter back. Lipke, who oh, I was drafting in the seventh round in mock drafts for the Dolphins all year long. I just, <laughs> I, I was like, oh, he's the he's the fullback specialist, right? And he, he was doing well until that fumble. But yeah, I I think I I was uh, I'm guilty as charged, Jake. I think I was just like, yeah, okay, cool, whatever. You stopped him at the one, but you know, QB sneak next play, or they're just gonna pound it up the middle with Tony Pollard again. And no, they went with the the ultra reliable fullback dive, uh, which hasn't worked in Madden for a long time. That used to be like the unstoppable. That used to be the tush push in Madden. Like you just ninety nine percent of the time it was going to work, but now it, they like they like took it out of the game. They were like, no, it's too easy. We're not letting you do it anymore. Um, but yeah, you know, it it was one of those things where you're reminded that those guys are professional football players and, and they take pride in their jobs and they are, uh, they are better than we are as, as fans sitting here going, just give them the points. Who cares? I don't care anymore. Christmas is ruined. This game sucks. And they're like, no, we're, we're going to keep playing until, until our final breath. And, and that's what happened. And they got the turnover and, uh, and that was obviously very consequential as the dolphins won the game by two points. Yeah, I think I'm with you guys. I was just like, just let him score. But uh, how impressive was that, right? The way he swung him around and the ball never crossed the goal line. I mean, I was like, damn, that was an awesome play. So um, shout out to Deshaun Elliott. I mean, again, he helped with CeeDee Lamb. Huge play at the goal line that, like Merrick said, kind of decided this one. So that was an awesome way for that first drive to end. Um, and um, also, dreamed up that. guess who had Tony Pollard in fantasy? Nice. It was I. You were the <laughs> was super I. Smush. You were the yeah. super smush. I love it. I, I, my fantasy team was sacrificed so that the Dolphins could get this victory. That was the key here. And, uh, two, I think one thing we kind of complained, not really complained about early in the year, the Dolphins just were winning games and yet like losing the turnover battle minus two, minus three. The Dolphins are slowly putting it together where the turnover battle is swinging back their way. It, can we start to say, can we stamp Brandon Jones as a turnover magnet? He runs out of that pile with that uh, fumble recovery. He had two interceptions last week. He doesn't have those highlight plays, but he seems to always be around the ball. And if the Dolphins are going to end up being one of the teams that, hey, you know, you have a good defense, you have a good offense, all of a sudden that turnover, quote unquote, luck is going to slowly start to swing back your way. If it's his fault, I'll, so I'll happily give him credit for it. What do you think Brandon Jones has more forced turnovers or more times injuring his own teammates this season? Oh, dude, that's so <laughs> I know. Two, I should just, add, I, two, two, I, some, sometimes things two just pop three, in your head. Two to three, I think it is. <laughs> two injuries, three, three turnovers. No, he's Brandon Jones is like, uh, maybe I'll try and do your job here, Jake. He's like that kid. Who, who you hear rustling downstairs, you loud banging, bunch of noise. You go down there and you, you see the cookie jars toppled over. There's crumbs all over the ground. You look at him and he's got chocolate all over his face. And then he just gives you that big smile and you go, damn it, I can't be mad at him. <laughs> so, that's Brandon Jones, right? Like he does a couple things every game where you're like, what the hell are you doing, dude? And then he, he does something just fantastic and spectacular. And you're like, oh, yeah. Well. That's like, empty why the we dishwasher. Like you yeah, that, that's why we like you, John. Did you see that bruise he had on his back that his wife posted on Instagram that was going around Twitter? Like he has a massive bruise on his back. From yeah, he someone. looks like he was in a street fight. He launched. He he gives it 110 every single play. I definitely got to give him that. And um, one other player I wanted to bring up, Xavier Howard, kind of kind of let me down a little bit. He got Not lost on game. one play. I'm telling you this right now. Uh, that's kind of where X is as a corner right now. There are going to be a couple of plays where he might look a little bad, but over the next three weeks, whether it be uh, Baltimore Bills or first round of the playoffs, he's going to stamp it. He's going to make some sort of play that could really help determine the game. I, I think he's due for a big performance. 
I sure hope so. And, you know, he he's still a good player. He's he's getting up there in so age a little bit, and and you know, it's that time of year where everybody's dealing with injuries. And he was held out of a game a couple weeks ago with an injury, so he's probably still dealing a little bit with something like that. Um, but you know, it's it's not about one player. It's not just one guy. It's the sum of all parts. And I think he he he's more positive than negative still, even at this stage of his career. So we'll we'll keep him on this defense. You know at least for the remainder of the season, not like they have another choice, but uh, uh, he's still a contributing player on this defense and anyone's going to struggle uh, against a, a solid offense oh, yeah. like, like the Cowboys. So, uh, but that's what you're going to be facing from here on out is solid offenses. Like you said, with the Ravens, the bills, and then whoever you play in the playoffs, you know, they got there for a reason. So uh, we'll see what happens, but I do have trust that X will turn it back around and, and, and round back into form here soon. Yeah, for most of the season, he's been pretty awesome. So I'm okay with this one bad game. You just can't have it happen against the Ravens or Bills or in the playoffs, like Jay said. But we know he's going to get a pick six or something, and we're all going to be sitting here. Xavier Howard's the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Merrick, it's a little bit of an awkward week for us. So I'm, if you have a game prediction for next week, we'll take it. Otherwise, I just want to get your thoughts, how we're feeling, entering a very, very wild stretch where – can you think of the last time the Dolphins not only had a playoff spot sealed this early, but still had so much to play for? Where are the one seeds still on the table with two weeks of play? Because, I mean, uh, I, I can't think of a time. I genuinely, happened. yeah, no, I can't remember. It's not like we have a lot of, like, options to choose from either. <laughs> so, I mean, last last year they made the playoffs in the final game of the season. Uh, pod. Yeah, a, a, a few years, a few quite a few years earlier than that they also kind of made the playoffs late and just, yeah no i mean we're we're in we're in the dance playoff playoffs have been clinched you know it's all up to seeding now the one seed still very much in play two seed very much in play i think they can go as low as the sixth seed they are not eligible for the seventh seed or the fourth seed is what i i think i read um so We'll see where they end up. You know, hopefully, you know, everyone's got their fingers crossed for this number one seed. Certainly, certainly an option. They they got to start by beating the Ravens this weekend. I feel very confident about this Dolphins team and the way they're playing moving forward. Um, and, and then I saw that Ravens game against the 49ers in San Francisco, Santa Clara, actually. Uh, I've, I've been in that stadium. It's a great stadium. I had some very cool moments in that stadium. I got to stand on stage in front of 80,000 people in that stadium. So that was a pretty cool moment. Um, but they looked real good. Ravens looked real good against the damn good football team, the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, I saw Mike Florio on the Pro Football Talk uh, Twitter account, X account, tweet out. Um, he had been drinking. He's a Vikings fan, so he didn't have himself a good day. Uh, he had been, he tweeted out, didn't censor it or anything. So I won't, he said, the Ravens will kick the shit out of the dolphins on Sunday. That's what he said. Is it going to happen? I'm not sure, but I hope that the dolphins coaches have printed out that tweet a thousand times over and hung it up in every locker in the, in, in the practice facility, in the coaches offices and let everybody know that that is public perception out there right now, that the Ravens will kick the shit out of the Miami Dolphins. And that comes after the Dolphins supposed to, or we're supposed to have a narrative busting victory, right? Can't beat the good teams. Hasn't beat, and they haven't beat anybody that has a, a over 500 records. Well, the Cowboys were 10 and four going into that game. That's a good offense. And they quieted that offense after the first quarter, you know? And honestly, they were just a couple long, plays that that 49 yard touchdown to cd and then that bomb to tolbert over Xavier later in the game without those two plays that offense did nothing against the miami dolphins defense so after a victory like that it's supposed to be narrative busting you still have figureheads and talking heads uh, of of you know public accounts people follow these accounts and they just parrot what they say you still have this dude coming out and saying the ravens will kick the shit out of the miami dolphins and i've said it three times now and I'm not so sure that's going to happen. And it, it very well, it might happen. But I really hope that that's, you know, part of the motivation that the Dolphins are going to have going into this game to say, you know what? That's not going to happen. We are not that team anymore. We are a good football team. And we're going to prove it on Sunday when we play the Baltimore Ravens. We're going to go into Baltimore and we're going to handle business. And I really hope they do. 
I, you don't need a prediction from me, right? <laughs> it's a, well, well, you got the Dolphins winning, though, right? Just say it. Come on, just say it. <laughs> you put me on the spot there. Um, uh, final score. All right. I haven't done any thinking about this, but final score, I'm going to take – I will. I will take the Dolphins in this one. I'll take them 20 to 18. Another two point victory, low scoring on the road. It's going to be a little bit chilly or not too chilly. I think I saw low 40s for that one. The the games, uh, the 1 p.m. start time. Um, I will not be able to watch this game. I will be exploring some Mayan ruins, but I'll, hopefully I got some reception so I can keep an eye on the score. But uh, I'll take the Dolphins 20 to 18 in this one. And and Mike Florio will be tweeting something about the Dolphins being legitimate Super Bowl contenders after that game. This is an interesting, interesting matchup, too, because there was a long while where the Baltimore Ravens had Miami's number, where I, I think I see, what, five straight losses. I see a three-game losing streak where Baltimore won 59 to 10, 40 to nothing. 38 to zero dating back to 2016. Um, but, but these last two ma- matchups have been pretty fun, especially as a Dolphins fan. There was that primetime game uh, back in 2021 where uh, they kind of broke Lamar Jackson, uh, the Brian Flores uh, cover zero defense. The Dolphins won that game 22 to 10. And then obviously you go back to early last season. It was one of the Kevin Harlan specials, 42 to 38. You know, he's got Waddle, all that fun stuff. So it should be a very fun matchup against two of the best teams of the NFL. And that's probably the best Christmas gift I could have gotten is getting to say that about the Miami Dolphins. That is all the time we have today here on another Dolphins podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, having it be Christmas and then new year's just a couple days away. We're probably just going to do two pods this week. We'll have a game preview on Thursday. So stay tuned for that, but that is it. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next time until then. Fins up. Fins up baby. Fins up. Fins up.